All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. An interesting thing, because now you're getting to the point where Jesus is on trial, and we get to the point of very close to the crucifixion. But how are you going to take this? If, indeed, God, or whatever you want to call this entity of the universe, uh, conditions your forgiveness on torturing somebody to death in a most grotesque, violent, cruel way, makes you wonder, doesn't it? I mean, haven't you always wondered, isn't there a better way to forgive people and get everybody together than by ripping somebody to pieces and uh, beating somebody uh, so he bleeds to death? You then have to look at the Bible and you have to look at crucifixion and all of these things in the way that it's intended. And let me show you a couple of scriptures that I hope you may be able to look and begin to say, what, am I, what do I have here? Take a look at page 1008 in your Bible, and I'll show you something that many, many of you have never seen before. All right? Now, you know that Jesus uh, was crucified in Golgotha, uh, outside of the walls of Jerusalem, um, in, uh, on Calvary, okay? This is something that you're, you've, you're, you've been taught all of your life, and you're aware that this is the case, okay? Watch this very carefully as, as I share it with you. Revelation chapter 11, on page 1008. Now look at verse 8, okay? And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. See that? Now, that in the Bible means you have to take a real close look at this word crucifixion. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ. What was it? And why does it say that he was crucified in Sodom and Egypt when the other part of the book says he was crucified in Jerusalem outside of the city? Because you have to begin to understand the implications of this to your life spiritually as something deeply of spirit. Look at this too. Go to page 812 before we start. And look at Mark chapter 4. Okay? Mark chapter 4, page 812. And look at verse 11. And Jesus said unto them, Unto you is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. There has to be a symbolic meaning to everything. Otherwise, you're left with the fact that there is some controlling element in the universe that has not the ability to forgive unless that forgiveness is conditioned on bloodletting and violence and death and killing and maiming. That's not the way it is. What you have seen in here is that this crucifixion and all of the elements of Bible and ancient script are given for you to understand that they actually address you and what must occur within you if you are to quote unquote find this thing called salvation. Okay? There is no God that says, I can't forgive you unless I murder somebody. There is no God that would use people to torture somebody to death and they're not even know that they're being used in order to forgive people. There is a God who has created this universe and placed a Jesus flesh within each one of you and showed you in parable and allegorical terms how that Jesus flesh must be dispensed so that the Christ part of you can rise into everlasting glory by means of the higher realms of consciousness of the human mind. Now, so let's go to page 806 and we'll go into the prelude to this story and begin to look at this symbolically and allegorically and in the realm of parable as Jesus says and begin to try to understand what's being said and why it's being said what's being done and why it's being done Matthew chapter 27 and verse 26 then released he Barabbas unto them and when he had scourged Jesus he <coughs> delivered him to be crucified he released Barabbas, the controlling factor, releases Barabbas unto the mobs, unto the multitudes. Why? Because they don't understand who stands for the value of life. 
And basically what you have here is you have Jesus representing, that's not a good color, they have, you, you have Jesus which represents the right hemisphere of the brain or the divine aspect of consciousness. You have Barabbas who represents the lower aspect of consciousness. And who does the crowd say that they trust give us Barabbas? There is nobody you will find in any church in this county, in this state, or in this town, except in very few of them, that will say, I will choose that which is the divine consciousness. I will choose that which is the higher consciousness. They'll say, no, I will trust that which is my lower mind. The crowd says, always give us Barabbas, because Barabbas represents the lower mind. Barabbas represents the traditions. Barabbas represents the culture. Barabbas represents everything that you've ever been born and raised and lived with. And the crowd always says, give us that. I'll trust this. In fact, religion says, don't, stay away from this. This is the new age. Don't get near this. Stay with this. Stay with the lower mind. So, mistakenly, they choose the lower realm of the carnal ego, which is represented by Barabbas. That's where it's in there. What the heck would it be in the Bible for? Such a stupid thing. I mean, just use your common sense as grown adult people. Would a group of people standing outside somewhere say, let Charlie Manson go and kill Pope John? I mean, be, be real. It's the same thing. There's no difference. It's so stupid that it's in there to let you see what the heck the truth is. Moses Maimonides says when you see something so stupid in the Bible that your common sense says it's ridiculous, stay there. God's trying to show you something. This is what's being said here. The mobs will always choose, the crowd will always choose that which is the lower flesh and want nothing to do with that which is the higher mind. That's what's being said there. Now, in the matter of the scourging, they bring Jesus to the scourging and they tie him to a pole and they rip them to pieces with this whip and so forth and so on. I mean, this is all part of God's divine plan. So he can forgive you from smoking or some stupid thing, you know, that, you know, idiotic thing. That they rip this man to shreds to forgive you for, you don't even know what. But what is it all about? He had to be scourged. Scourging is a lashing out upon the back. That's what went through this particular thing, okay? The back is the location of the spine. The spine is the location of the point of energy from which flows that which we call in mystic circles Kundalini. Okay, look at what I'll show you. Go to page 1005 in the Bible and look at Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. We've, we've seen that the mob and the system and the forces of the system First of all, we'll choose that which is the lower over that which is the higher. Now they start lashing out, and what do they lash out against? Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. Here's the book of life. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within, that's within you, and on the back side sealed with seven seals. Bang! That's what they're lashing out at. That's what they're lashing out at. That's what they've got to rip to pieces. That's what they come against. That's why the scourging is an important part of this particular picture. Because the system, even those closest to you, will lash out against this. Those part of your family members, even though it's in the Bible, they never talk about it. How many of you have ever had people who claim to be born again who ever tell you about the book of life, which is written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals? How many of you have ever sat down to discuss it? They can't even acknowledge such a thing. And here it says that they last out. The system rises in its fury and comes against this type of thing. And they'll do it in, in whatever way they can because they don't understand it. They're afraid of it. What was Jesus doing? The whole book, he goes around healing blind people, getting little girls out of their thing, come to the little children. They've got to kill this guy. He's dangerous. Did you notice that? What did he ever do? He's a nice guy. He helps people. He does things for little kids. You know, don't hurt anybody. You shouldn't touch this. You do that. Everything is nice. How? He's... You can't be, when you do that, you're a threat to the system. It's like the Hare Krishnas in the airport. They worked like hell for years to get those people out of the airport because they were giving roses away. This is dangerous. These are flowers and they smell nice and they're dainty and you can't have that kind of a thing, see? But you could put a Marine Corps recruitment booth in there and that's perfectly all right. Yeah, hey, God bless them all. Let's go, get a gun. Say. Anybody that comes with the system with a, an approach of love and peace and heal is a threat to the system because that's not, the, that's not the way the system operates. So now we move into the will here, into the nature of God. 
as we study this, which is the crucifixion of the five senses. The part that is within you that must die, why is this here? <laughs> why is it always, it comes every week, that thing. It's brown, did you have, it's disgusting when you look at that. Okay, the Jesus part in you must die. That's the physical representation of the flesh. That must die. And why is Jesus so important? Because this part of you, that is the flesh part of you, is the part that has the capacity that once it dies, it becomes no longer man, it now becomes divine, it becomes Christ. That part of you must die. So let's take a look at Matthew 27 on page 806. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. Why are soldiers such a prominent part of this? Because for the crucifixion or for the death of the Jesus part of you to take place, there must be in your life that which soldiers represents mystically. And what it represents is discipline. Do you see what would happen to us the other night when we have to see Kataro? Most, so many of us, our discipline was totally destroyed because we, we couldn't figure what to do. Something had distracted us. Something had intervened between what we were looking for and what we were trying, and, 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 and the truth. And so we, we have to then learn from these types of things. And it's, a good, it's good that this happens and we start to look at it from the p position of a mysticism. We have to always discipline ourselves to break through the distractions and go to the center. That's why it's so difficult on Tuesday nights or on Thursday nights whenever you come to meditate because it's easier. It's much easier to stay home. Especially there's a World Series on, there's football games on, there's television on. It's much, much easier. And so it requires that part of you which is represented by soldiers at that part of you which is the discipline. Can you discipline? If you cannot discipline yourself, the Jesus within you will not die. And unless the Jesus dies, the Holy Ghost cannot come. And he said that. Unless I go, the Comforter cannot come. So unless the Jesus part of you, which is the flesh part of you, dies, then there can be no Holy Spirit within you. And in order for that to die, there must be the discipline. Because if you don't want to do it, then the heck with it. You don't want to do it. It's just that simple. You're not going to do it doesn't make any difference. You can get bored, you cannot feel good, something can interrupt you, something can, oh, I didn't like this, something, I didn't like that, the music's too loud, the music's too low, the music's too fast, the music's too slow, whatever you want to say, there's a million things that can cause you to say, I don't want to do it. And when you have made that decision, it's not going to happen. In this story, the good guys are the guys that kill them. The bad guys are the guys that say, oh, don't do it. See, the people that are surrounding you say, oh, don't go, don't meditate, don't do these things, they're not helping you. The ones that come and say, slaughter the flesh, kill the flesh out, kill that which is the lower, those are the ones who are saying, as soon as Jesus dies, he becomes Christ. And that's within you. That's the miracle of this story. It doesn't happen. It doesn't have to happen to somebody 50,000, 200,000, 2,000 years ago. It happens to you right now. But you have to discipline yourself. You've got to fill yourself with an orderly discipline to do this work. And you cannot let anything disrupt the mission by which you have been sent here. And that's why you're sitting here. Otherwise, what the heck are you listening to me for? I mean, you could go to a church. You could be in a church singing Amazing Grace somewhere. And I mean, it could be really traditional. And you could have people telling you that you're going to get healed and all of these wonderful things are going to happen. And it makes you feel good. Even if, when it doesn't happen, it's still because when it doesn't happen, you say, well, it didn't happen this time, but next time it'll happen. So you'll go back. And it never will happen, but then you'll die someday and it'll, no, what's the difference, you know? <laughs> Who cares? You, you had a good time and no, nothing, you know. But you missed it. You missed the cataclysmic eruption of this age of Aquarius, of Nirvana, busting through within yourself, of opening that flower within yourself and allowing it to bloom. Say, like, that's exciting. But it takes you the need to discipline. Look at Matthew 27, page 806, verse 28. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. Okay? Important. To be naked is to remove all the coverings of that which are the 
points of your life. Those things which you cling to have to be stripped away. Those things, think of them, what are important to you? It can be your children and their attitudes, it can be your family and their attitudes. I have had to have stripped away from me, Jonah's had to have stripped relationships with our own families because they can't deal with this. So then we had to take them off. Because our mission is too great and nothing can stop it. Think of what it is, and it, and it can be something that deprives you of your meditation. Whatever it is, it has to be stripped away. You have to be naked. To be naked is to remove all worldly coverings. Everything that, there can be nothing that stands between you and that which is the God power. Absolutely nothing. Nothing can touch you or else the separation cannot take place. That's the virgin consciousness. That's to be stripped away. To be, remember in the Adam and Eve story? They were naked. It means they did not have anything covering them. They had nothing touching them that was the world. They had nothing touching them that was tradition. They had nothing touching them that was doctrine. They had nothing touching them that was important. The things that are important to you, that didn't touch them. They were totally pure dwelling in that hemisphere of nirvana and they were untouched by anything. But what happened? When they abandoned the right side, went to the left side, what's the first thing they went to do? They had to get something to cover themselves. So they took those things of the earth to cover them. They took those things of the earth to protect them. And we've done that all of our lives. We've tried to be protected by the things of the earth, by the things of religion, by the things of government. Right now you've got politicians all over the place. You hear them come on radio? Charlie so-and-so has fought for lower taxes while Phil so and so has done all of these and they're just yelling at one another and screaming at one another don't vote for him because he's no good vote for him and it's all chaos all absolutely loony because you see the destruction the same people that destroyed everything want another chance to try to straighten out what they screwed up in the first place <coughs> and so what do we do we cling to these clothes that are bringing us to this point of death and so when you strip Jesus Christ when you strip Jesus you're taking away everything that causes that part of you to be touched by the outside. Okay. Matthew 27, 28. And this is a beautiful part. And they put on a scarlet robe. You have to go into mysticism and into your Gaskill's book and all of that stuff and look up the color scarlet. Okay? The color scarlet in mysticism means divine life. See? Divine life. They strip away. Don't you wish, don't, for God's sakes, do you understand what you, what you just, what you just saw is meditation. You strip away, you take away the thoughts that are of the outside and you put upon yourself those thoughts which are divine. They strip the clothes, the things that touch you from the outside are no longer near you. They are no longer touching you. All that touches you now is that which is the kingship, that which is the divine. So in removing those worldly coverings or removing the coverings of the thoughts of the outside, we only surround ourselves which are the divine thoughts which are high above in the realms of the higher divine realms of consciousness. The divine spirit is, is, is described. Let me, let me show you something on page 566 in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs. You see, the point is, there, if you're going to look at the Bible, then there would have to be a reason that all of this happened. Do you understand that? There will have to be a reason that they put a scarlet robe on. What's the reason? There would have to be a reason that they did all of the things that they did. Everything in there has to have a mystical reason, or else it can't be in the Bible. Then it could be in a history book. And you'll never find a word of this in any history book. It doesn't know of anything. Mm -hmm. Proverbs chapter 31, page 566. Look at this, this is mysticism too. She, meaning the spirit, is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. Can you break that code? Huh? She, that which is the inner spirit, okay, is not afraid of the, what? Snow. What is snow? Huh? Snow is water which is truth but it is bound by that which is the cold and unrelenting of the outside but she will not worry about that See? she will not listen to what is portended as the truth which comes from the cold outside because her household your inner spirit is covered with scarlet which is the divine realm of nirvana huh? of god you see see what it says okay 
I don't know whether you see, I don't know whether you're over here. It doesn't make any difference whether you're here, because if you're not here, then I'm here. And I heard it, and it's exciting as hell to me, you know. But what's the difference? You don't have to be here. You don't want to be here. <laughs> so here then, what has happened? He is stripped, meaning you are no longer touching the outside, and now he is covered with scarlet, meaning he is preparing for this great time of oneness with that which is with it. It has nothing to do with scarlet clothes. It has nothing to do with taking your clothes off. It has nothing. It has to do with the fact that when you fulfill yourself by entering within and separating from the outside, you are then covered with the divine things of what you call God. Let's, make, let's go back to page 806. Look at Matthew 27 and look at verse 29. Matthew 27 and verse 29. Nine. And when they had platted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his, which hand? Right. Very important that it's in his right hand. Okay, A reed in his right hand, they bowed in before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. This is the most difficult time. Okay. Because that which is so precious to you, that which you come in here and when the lights go down, you enter into that deep, rich, mystical, personal experience of life with God is, is, is a subject of mockery to the outside. It's a joke, you know. In fact, it's, oh, it's a cult. You're, you're some kind of Eastern, you know, cultism. It's like Ouija boards and all of this kind of stuff, you know, stay away from this stuff. It's, it's, it's a joke. It's a warning, you know. So, so they, they, this is part of the thing that you go through. The symbol of authority, then, of the scepter is placed in the right hand, which is power and wisdom, which comes from the right hemisphere of the brain. Right there. And they don't even realize it. Nobody understands it. But it says in the Bible that even in its, even in its point of, of, of swinging out against it, that acknowledgement of the right side is there. And the crown of thorns is, what is it a mockery about? It's a mockery of that which is called in Kabbalah the crown, the higher consciousness. In the Kabbalah, the higher consciousness is called the crown. And so they put this, but it's, it's, to, it's, it's to sting the flesh, see. It's not understood, the, the, the inner workings of it, the, the beauty of it is not understood. So the system mocks the higher, they mock the right side, and it's a painful part of the crucifixion of the flesh for you and me because my whole life, and, and you know when I was watching those people up there, there's so many thousands of people, you get off a bus in New York and people going, and I wondered if everybody knew this, if everybody just knew this, if everybody in the world only understood this, what a difference. If everybody in the world understood this, the heaven that religion says is waiting for you would be here. Everybody, because your whole life would be given to a oneness. Everybody's life would be given to a oneness. And all of that which is evil would be gone away because the, the consciousness of people would be fed from the right side. Even the, somebody was telling me, uh, I guess it was Debbie, that they saw a television show. Uh, I don't know where, which, which television program it was on. But 24 whales or dolphins or something had beached themselves. And the scientists said it was obviously an attempt to commit suicide. You can't even, we can't even look, we can't even understand why, you know, we were at Great Adventure yesterday and they were saying, you know, these, these, these dolphins are not fish. They, 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 they're another type of whatever you call it, uh, animal, amphibian or whatever, mammal, but they have, a, they have a tremendous intelligence and they're communicating with you and they're telling us, this is no good, this is wrong, you're crucifying him all over again, you're destroying mother, you are blaspheming this life and we are demonstrating this. Jesus Christ could give his life and everybody could say, oh, what a miraculous, wonderful thing. These magnificent creatures are giving their lives constantly to wake us up. And no, oh, what the heck is going on? Nobody cares. We don't understand. Because we've never gotten close enough. We're so deeply ingrained in books. We're so deeply ingrained in the physical and the material. We've never gotten close to the life, to the animal life, where the true essence of God dwells. And so here, in the midst of all this, we've read about it, we watch it on television, we never stop and say, why? What comment is being made by nature when all of these magnificent things that can communicate with man are communicating by saying, we are committing suicide. To get your attention, we are sacrificing ourselves for you so that you will wake up. What else? What other reason? What possible cause? And so here in Matthew 27, 29, they say, Hail, King of the Jews. 
Because they don't understand. What did Jesus say when they say, Hail, King of the Jews? What did He say? My kingdom is not of this world. Understand it. And what do His followers seek to this day? Him coming back, setting up a kingdom here. And He was very clear. My kingdom is not of this world. The whole foundation of the religion called Christianity is based on a contrary opinion over what he said. They say he's coming back to set up a kingdom. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. The kingdom of God is within you. And so here they say, hail king of the Jews. They say, is that true? Is that, is that true? Is that what you say? That's what you say. Because you, a fakakta, don't know that man. You don't understand. You don't understand. And they say they look and look, but they don't see. They listen and listen, but they don't hear. What's he talking about? Go to page 920. Romans chapter 2, page 920. And see what the Apostle Paul says. Incidentally, for those of you who are going to be around tonight. Uh, last week we did the uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and we got to the front door and uh, this week we'll go inside and uh, all, the, all the good stuff happens. If you want to talk about an X-rated uh, Bible story, there it is. Well, we got them. <laughs> Romans chapter 2, verse 28, okay? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Verse 29. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Therefore, when they said, Hail Jesus, King of the Jews, they didn't know. What does he want? Does he want to be king of that? For what? King of the Jews is each one of us as we camp at the east side for the right hemisphere of the tribe of Judah and be one within king of the Jews. But I want you to see, I want you to see that. I want, you know, it's very important. This is very important for each one of us to understand. Because, you know, most of you have, before you wandered into this place, were, uh, you know, involved in, in one form of Christianity, either Catholic or Methodist or Baptist or Pentecostal or Independent or something like that. And your whole experience was based on the second coming of Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom here on this earth where he would live and reign for a thousand years and we would all reign with him, you know. But I want you, but since you come out of that, and you're listening to me, you say, well, this guy, what the heck? I want, I, want, I want you to see something. Go to page 884 with me, okay? In the book of John. And I mean, I ha and I will challenge any of the pastor, any preacher, any evangelist who would like. I will simply go by what it says in the Bible and say, hey, tell me this. Just you tell me. Your, the foundation of your religion is his second coming and setting up a kingdom on earth. And what does he say? Page 884, John chapter 18, verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I shouldn't be delivered to these Jews? But now is my kingdom not from hence. So what do you do with that? How did you, how are you people sitting here, how did you allow all of these people to... to to, to hold you under the grip of an expected second coming of Jesus setting up his kingdom. For what reason? What purpose did they do that? And why did you let them do that? Because there was nobody to tell you. There was nobody to challenge it. There was nobody who would dare say anything against it. Well, I dare say something against it. And you will have to dare to say something against it because it wasn't true because it went against the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. The same Lord Jesus Christ who said, Hey, you're the light of the world. You can do better than me. That's what he said. You can do better than him. The same Jesus Christ who in John 16 said, Listen to me. Don't pray to me. Go pray right to the Father. Don't pray to me. The same Jesus Christ who said, I'm not praying for you. The same Jesus Christ who said, What do you call me good? There's nobody good but the Father. And the Father is within you. 
The same Jesus Christ who said the kingdom is within you. The same Jesus Christ who said to you that the key to your life is seeking within yourself. The same Jesus Christ who said that the key to your experience with God is practicing the single eye. The same Jesus Christ who said that the power comes when you throw your net to the right side. The same Jesus Christ who everything that he has taught in the Bible, and I'll sit with anybody in the world, everything that he has taught in the Bible is called by the people who call themselves Christians and born again evil and occult. That same Jesus Christ said in Luke 6, 46, why do you people call me Lord and not do what I tell you to do? Hmm? It's in the book. As I say, how do I know? The Bible tells me so. And it tells you so. All you got to do is open it. And it's in the book. It's in the book. King of the Jews. We're almost done. Look at, uh, where are we? Page 806, Matthew 27. Verse 30. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And spit is a sign of contempt. And the sign of contempt from the outside is a sign of contempt against the inner Christ, that inner Christ which is within you. They took the reed and they don't understand the symbol of authority. Don't you see? They took the reed, which is the symbol of authority, which was in his right hand. They took that power and they smacked him on the head with it. Don't you know what's being said there? They misuse God's authority to bring burdens and bondage and infliction upon God's people. How do they do it? The things that he said to do, they call evil. They call them a cult. They strike out against him using the things that symbolize the power to hold you into the bondage of their way. That's what they do. You know, for God's sakes, you've gone through it. Somebody said to me the, the other couple of weeks ago that somebody had their neck in a collar and the evangelist came to the house and took the neck collar off and touched him on the head and his neck was healed. Good! Take the same guy to the muscular dystrophy ward and the first one that gets out of the wheelchair, I will bow to this guy. Take him to Lagos or Bonovia or Bosnovia and the first one where the God comes down to feed these little children, I'll bow to this guy. We're so, so stupid to fall for that stuff. Because the apostle Paul said flesh and blood and have no part of the kingdom of God. People sitting in wheelchairs who can't move one arm, can't move one leg, can't move one, are filled to the brim with that which is the knowledge of the holy place. They are 100% physically fit. People that are athletes are consumed with drugs and all kinds of other crap, and they are sick as they can be. People who are stone blind physically and have to have a German Shepherd dog walk with them can see into the realms of nirvana, see with 20-20 vision of the single eye. People who have two eyes and have 20-20 physical can't see 10 seconds in front of their face. They're totally locked into blindness. Physical has nothing to do with it. Because i got news for you. You know how it starts getting gray and everything and things start hanging in here like it all? Do you know something else? Spots come on your head. <laughs> what are brown spots on your head? Hey, nobody, can the guy come and heal the brown spots? No, he can't. It's the way the car is made. And it starts to clunk, and you lose, and you blow a tire, and your fender starts to get a little rusted. You know what I'm saying? The, 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 the cylinders don't hit all the time. <laughs> Me and the nurse were in great adventure thinking, we'll get a pass for the whole season next year. And you know what the nurse says? I wonder if they have a senior citizen's discount. <laughs> That's when you know it's going downhill. <laughs> I said, I don't want to hear about that. I'll pay the full price. <laughs> See? Don't worry about somebody getting healed with this or getting healed with that. 
No, the real healing that takes place is within. That's why so many people in nursing homes get institutionalized and become veg vegetables. You know why? Because they're hanging on to the physical, which is collapsing. They don't know the center to hang on to the center. You can sit wherever you sit, and as the outside deteriorates, the young side inside gets stronger and younger and younger and younger because it comes alive with nirvana, and the old goes away, and that young inside flies like a dove out of that body and finds a new body to begin this beautiful career of sharing the truth of the gospel of Christ. Don't hang on to the physical. The worst part of that is when they come with their evangelist and they take the collar off and the guy's neck doesn't. And the guy says, no, there can be no God. It has nothing to do with that. It says Matthew 27, 31, they mocked him, they took the robe, they put on his raiment, and they led him away to crucify him because you have to, it's the, it's the lower flesh that has to be crucified. So now comes the sacrifice. The ultimate decision by you because you've endured the ridicule, you've gone through the, all of these different things. The symbols of kingship are no longer symbols that have a meaning. You've got to acknowledge yourself. You've got to put aside all of the feelings and, and set about to do what must be done. And the crucifixion that comes and takes place in here. Allow yourself to die with no preconceived hopes. And this is the time. And I'm not talking about the physical. And you know, <clears throat> when I talk about an evangelist or something, you are the doctor. You're the doctor. Healings, magnificent things happen to people through their inner prayer, through their inner communion, through their meditation. Jesus said it. I mean, do you believe him? For God's sakes, he said it. He said, physician, heal yourself. What would happen if the guy didn't show up, the evangelist didn't show up? God would say, oh, it's tough. He's going to have to have a bad neck. No. It's not the way it is. We enter within ourselves and do the prayers. I think of Kathy's little cat, Junior. They never know what's going to happen. But Junior has a heart that skips and stops and starts. You know, one doctor said he's got 30 days. He'll be dead in 30 days. You know, Junior's part of the family. He's been there a long time. And uh, so we went up to Junior, and we began to whisper in his ear, Nam mio ho ringe kio. But you know, this is great, because we did it with ours. Cats know that. <laughs> when you start whispering something strange and mystic, cat just goes, <laughs> I'm going, oh, this guy's really not he's into this. I'm sorry to ask the cat, what does this mean? Do you know what that means? <laughs> so the cat's going, brr, brr. Now the latest thing is, Junior hit his 30 days, and the doctor told uh, her, I've had cats like this that have gone two years. <laughs> I says, keep saying them, yell in his ear, and all the doctors will be dead, and Junior will be sitting there, brr, brr. <laughs> But what I'm saying is inner prayer, inner healing, God, work on it. Go after everything that doesn't feel right. Speak to it in a new way. Yes, absolutely. You don't need some guy coming around. I'll never forget when Joan and I were at PTL, Jim Baker's open. It was a magnificent place. And we had, we came to like this little girl. She had muscular dystrophy. Charlita, her name, black girl. Sweet. We used to go in and feed her. And she couldn't, she couldn't feed herself. So we would take her in the cafeteria and I'm feeding her and I'm taking little, uh, little meatballs. I'm saying, open up, Charlie. You know, we, had a, we really had a lot of fun. We really did. One time I was carrying her and I dropped her out on the lawn and we're rolling on the lawn and she's saying, you're really something. You know, we had a great time. But we took her down to the healing line. The evangelist was there. And everybody that had a, a you know, a stiff neck or something, Oh, was talking in tongues. They didn't come near this girl. Remember? I had to go up to him. I said, hey, wait a minute. This girl's waiting for you down here. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, you gotta believe in Jesus' name. But she didn't. And she believed. I mean, she was... But the point is, why? He wouldn't go near her. Well, it's off limits, you know, because it might... You couldn't get a, a quick fix. That. You couldn't convince somebody that something had happened. But inside of you is that cosmic power which is exploding. So what do we learn today? <coughs> Allow the Jesus within you to go to the cross of meditation. 
Strip away all of that which touches you from the outside. Place upon yourself the scarlet robe of divine kingship. Within your right hand, take that symbol of authority. Let him place the crown of thorns, even when they do upon you, and mock that which is the symbol of your, your kingship. Allow yourself to say nothing, but move closer and closer into the divine robes. That's what Jesus did for you. That's what Jesus means to you. Because Jesus is not something that happened or a fable. Jesus is a person within you who goes to the cross within you and carries you in his loving arms up into that holy realm of nirvana. Amen. Thank you very much for spending that time uh, with Jesus Christ.